What is truth? This should not be a controversial question, yet today it is. Jesus Christ clearly defined truth, learned the real definition of truth, and the only way to find truth in any aspect of life. Next, on The Key of David with Gerald Flurry. Greetings, everyone. Strong's Concordance records the word truth about 300 times in his concordance, and yet almost nobody today knows what the truth is. And that, I believe, shows that we have lost our way with God. We don't know our Bibles the way that we should. So, that is especially true in the United States and Britain, the uh, birthright nations, and the Jewish nation, which is the scepter nation. Now, you can, if you don't understand that, you can request our book on the United States and Britain and prophecy, and it will explain all of that to you. But today, a lot of people will say, well, I have my truth and you have your truth, and they'll be very different. And of course, that cannot be because somebody is wrong or both of them. <laughs> That's, that's a real problem, and it's the same problem even that Christ faced when He was on this earth. And He brought that issue out just before He was about to be crucified. Notice John 18 and verse 37, Pilate therefore said unto Him, are you a king then? Jesus answered, well, You say that I am a king. To this end was I born. And for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Well, how about that? He came into this world to bear witness unto the truth. So this has to be critical. It goes on to say, Every one that is of the truth hears my voice. That's Revealing. And then just the first part of verse 38 says, Pilate said unto him, What is truth? He didn't know what truth was. What is it? Passover time was uh, upon them, and here Jesus Christ was about to be savagely beaten and crucified and marred more than any man, Isaiah says. So, uh, why did Christ discuss truth at this time? Why was He bringing up that issue? Well, it certainly ties into Passover and those holy days of God. Verse 37, Christ actually discussed uh, the truth just before the crucifixion. It was getting very close, and Pilate didn't know. And most people don't know, and if we don't know what the truth is, then we're going to be in, in darkness spiritually. We need to understand this. It's a super foundational subject. In verse 37, Christ also said, Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. That surely is revealing and critically important because he's saying, look, if you are of the truth, you hear my voice. Well, how, how important is it to hear God's voice and prove that you're hearing it? That's what he's talking about, a revealing statement to be sure. Hear Christ's voice if you are of the truth. Go back to verse 38 again. And I'll finish it. And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and said unto them, I find in him no fault at all. And then on down in uh, verse 1 of chapter 19, he had no fault in him at all, but he started out with scourging Christ with whips. Nevertheless, this was a Gentile tyrant of a very violent nature. Then, uh, and the soldiers, plaited a crown of thorns, and put it on his head, 
And they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. And then Pilate said, I see no fault in this man. Then verse 5, Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said unto them, Behold the man. He realized this was a man's man. Jesus Christ was a real man, and this tyrant, savage, <laughs> recognized this was a man. And he knew a lot about, certainly, warriors. And Christ was that indeed. So, and he went on and said, I find no fault with him. And notice then in verse 7 it says, The Jews answered him, We have a law, and our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. He's saying he's the Son of God. And that's, that's a death penalty, they thought, or at least said that. Verse 8, When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid. Now here is this fiercely deranged leader in many ways. He was more afraid because he said, This man was calling himself the Son of God. And it made him more afraid. He realized it could be and thought about it, and it added fear to his mind. Pilate was certainly a tyrant, and a man's man was standing there before him, and he knew this man was special. And then he began to wonder, uh, it, it certainly seems, if he was really the Son of God. Was that the truth? Was that truth? He's, that's the subject here, really, that Christ Himself brought up. Must have been awfully important for Christ to do that. So this violent, barbaric Roman soldier was more afraid. When you think about the Son of God, and if you really believe that, well, we ought to have some fear in our lives and in our minds. This is a, an ultimate truth before us. But Pilate wondered, see, is this really the Son of God? Something like that. And Christ brought it up, and, uh, and it was just before he was going to be crucified. And Pilate said, well, I think three times there, I find no fault with this man. There's no fault in him. But he went ahead and crucified him anyhow, because the Jews were demanding that. Of course, we all have killed Christ by our sins. That's what killed him, and he had to die to pay for those sins. That is the truth, part of it, a big part of the truth. In verse 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the Scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now, this is verse 28. What does he mean that the Scripture might be fulfilled here? Oh, he's talking about a verse or Scripture that has to be fulfilled. He, he had to die, and he knew that. He had to be fiercely whipped with whips that had lead in the end of them and just ripped flesh apart. And he had to prepare for that as well. And, uh, and then verse 30, it goes on to say, He died. It was over. It was finished. He had finished the work they came here for. It's about Scripture. This truth is about Scripture. And you can receive many blessings from having the truth. Christ talks about that in many places. In Psalm 91, in verse 4, it says, He shall cover you with feathers, and under His wings shall you trust. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You have a shield and a buckler. God wants to be a shield for you in this dangerous world. That's quite a power to have and quite a protection to have. Verse 3 of Psalm 43 says, O send out your light and your truth. God is telling us, well, okay, well, if you have 
you have the truth, you're going to have light with you. You're going to have light, not be in darkness. Isaiah 59, verse 8, I'll just paraphrase it for you. It just there talks about peace and truth. You've got peace if you have truth. If you have the truth, that's what you have. Then Zechariah 8 and verse 19, it says, And the fast of the tenth shall be to the house of Judah joy and gladness and cheerful feast. Therefore, love the truth and peace. Love the truth and peace, and you're going to have joy and gladness and cheerful feast. That's a promise from God. It has to happen. He can't lie. Satan can't tell the truth. There's no truth in him. Amazing. And he's the God of this world. That's what your Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4. All of that comes with the truth. There are also some curses that come with it. So we have to be aware of those as well. Here's a couple of verses about God's own church in this end time. And they had the truth. And here's what began to happen, and now is in a terrible, terrible shape. That is, the church is. Verse 10 of 2 Thessalonians 2. Verse 10 says, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that are perishing, it should read, are perishing, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. They didn't love the truth. Well, we have to love the truth, or we're in serious trouble. Verse 12, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. They just didn't want to follow God. They wanted to go into the world and do their thing there. And then uh, you can read Daniel 8 and verse 12, where it tells you that God's own people cast truth to the ground. They didn't want it anymore. They just cast it to the ground. No wonder they were perishing. That's a serious problem. We have to know the truth, especially here in the end time. Love the truth. Malachi's message will tell you a lot about that. We have to love the truth. And let me just read you about love tied in and connected to uh, the truth. Here's what 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 1 says. This is the Revised Standard Version. And this is the love of God he's talking about, agape. It's about the love of God, and God just keeps repeating it here in His Scriptures. Verse 1, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Love is everything. God is love. It goes on to say, If I give away all I have, and if I deliver my body to be burned, but have not love, I am nothing. You see, the Love is everything. That's what he's saying. But now in the King James Version, I want to read verse 6. I like this verse a little better, and it makes it much more clear, I think. Verse 6 says, God's love rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. You see, this love of God rejoices in the truth. And we can too and must. Rejoice in the truth. It brings joy and rejoicing into our lives. God rejoices in the truth. And He wants us to follow that example, and we'll have all kinds of joy and cheerful feasts and wonderful lives. It's all about God's love is a mighty part of the truth. And what is that truth? We must know. 
Ephesians 4 and verse 15 says, But speaking the truth in love may grow up into Him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Christ is the head of the church. We have to speak this in love, not uh, hate or anything like that. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 5 says, The corrupt minds of people are destitute of the truth. They're deprived of it in many ways because their gain is money, not godliness. That's the problem. See, this, this world needs the truth, but they're, in, the, in this case, they're lusting for money most of all. And then uh, verse 32 of John 8 says that truth shall make you free. Verse 40 tells you they were going around trying to kill him because he told them the truth. Oh, how deceived they were, and how deceived this world is. Revelation 12 and verse 9, the whole world is deceived about such important issues and about certainly about the truth. They're deceived mightily. And here Christ was about to be crucified, and, and they didn't know who He was, and they killed Him because, well, that's what the people wanted. But you see, again, that doesn't save us, Christ being crucified. That's not enough. We are saved by His life, Romans 5 and verse 10. Romans 5 and verse 10, if you go ahead and read about Satan in John 8 and verse 44, he's a murderer and a liar, and the truth is not in him. There's no truth in him. There's nothing but the opposite of truth. That's a real problem. John 17 and verse 17, it says, Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. Here's the truth. It, the Word of God, the Bible, God's Bible, the Old Testament, the New Testament, your Word is truth. Your Word is Christ in print. That's how critical this is. That's what your Bible is all about. It's Christ in print, and you can believe every word of it, and you can prove it. You absolutely can. Matthew 4 and verse 4 says, We are to obey every word of God that is proclaimed out of His mouth. That's what we're commanded to do. See, that's, that, that sets us apart out from the world. That's what sanctifying means. It sets us apart from this world. And we're right there with God Himself, backing and supporting us and loving us in every way you can imagine. Verse 19 adds something to it, And for their sakes I sanctify myself, I set myself apart, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. That truth will sanctify you. It will really get you in step with God. And uh, what could be more important than that? Well, nothing. Zechariah 8 and verse 3, notice this amazing statement. Verse 3 of Zechariah 8, Thus says the Eternal, I am returned unto Zion, and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth, and the mountain of the Eternal of hosts, the holy mountain. So here is Jerusalem is a city of truth. Do you think we need some cities of truth today. Jerusalem is going to become the capital of the world and even the universe. And God says here, it's, it's, it's going to be a city of truth, and it's going to teach the whole world about having cities of truth. What a wonderful truth this is! This is the truth. God's Word is right there for all of us. His Word is the truth. Notice what it produces. Verse 4, Thus says the Eternal of hosts, There shall yet old men and old women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem. They're safe and secure. Nobody does anything negative to them. 
and every man with his staff in his hand for very age. He's old, elderly. Verse 5, And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. Well, how about that? This is the city of truth, and nobody is doing anything violent. They're loving each other, and they're loving their children, and they're loving their elderly people and taking good care of them and making sure they have a wonderful life to the very end, physically anyhow. Notice what it says in verse 7, Thus says the Eternal of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country, all over the world, and I will bring them, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness." Well, how about that? These are people from all over the world, and they're going to come to right into the midst of Jerusalem and see how to have a city of truth and a whole continent of truth. Everybody's going to have the truth all over the world in this beautiful picture here. How can you not be excited about that when you compare it to our cities today? in this world today, how we desperately need this, and God's going to give it to us, and it's provable all the way through that Bible. Provable! And we can show that to you anytime you want to check it out. We can certainly do that, and you can prove it, and you don't have to follow a man ever. That's You must not do. Well, it goes on to talk about truth and peace. And again, here it says in the last part of verse 19, I think I may have read this before, but I'll read it to you again. And the fast of the tenth shall be to the house of Judah joy and gladness and cheerful feast. Therefore, love the truth and peace. Love the truth and peace. Yea, many people and strong nations, strong nations shall come to seek the Eternal of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Eternal. Isn't that the most wonderful vision you could have? Until next week, this is Gerald Flurry. Goodbye, friends. All our literature is available free of charge at no cost or obligation to you. Request John's Gospel, The Love of God, The Eternal Has Chosen Jerusalem, and What is Truth. Order now. The preceding program was a paid presentation of The Key of David, brought to you by the Philadelphia Church of God.